All right. So hi again, everybody, everybody, everybody. My braces are making me have a lisp. But then hi again, everyone. It's the Abuja Tri Society. It's the Book Jam event. It happens every last Friday of the month. Today, we're having a reading circle, and it's going to be hosted by myself, Tenya Latayo, and then Aida Oluwa Um, I mean, it's just about sharing some of the books that we love with each other, talking about our books, one of the favorite things that literature nerds, like I call myself, like to do. And we hope that, I mean, I, I hope that it's going to be a good time. I think it's going to be a good time, as Aida has said. So we have, Aida is going to be the main host for the Reading Circle, actually. So I'm going to be handing over to you now, Aida. But then I can see that there's one hand up, which is Sanusi. Aida, are you there? You're muted. Um, yes, I am here. I thought you said you had um, one hand. If there was one hand up. Yes, yeah, Sanusi's hand is up. So we can start with Sanusi. Okay. All right then. Hi everybody. My name is Ada. I am a curator and writer for those who um, registered at recordings. I just wanted to introduce myself again. Um, so since I would be leading, I think that people can start by introducing themselves so that we know who is talking. And then you can explain by mentioning the name of the book or also Tanya, I was going to ask a question. Are they all going to be books? Or can people also share like other genres like poetry? No, it's, it can be novels, it can be poetry. So I reckon just um, one minute excerpts or maximum of 90 seconds uh, excerpts of whatever it is. I mean, when it's poems, usually it means I can read the entire poem. But if it's a novel, then you can only read um, maybe part of a page or something like that. But people okay. introduce themselves already but maybe they'll just say their first name and then they can go into the the reading all right then so like you give us the title and the genre if it's a book or a poetry um a poem you're going to be sharing and then after reading you share your thoughts with us and i think after that people who have like opinions or comments can then signify by raising their hands and then we can just talk about that or hear everybody else's opinion so as soon as you're up Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sanusi, I introduced myself earlier. So what I'm reading is a poem. I've shared the, the title of the poem and the author um, on the chat, in the chat there. So you could also Google it and follow if you like. It, it became one of my favorite poems. Um, I think I discovered it sometime in 2020. Yeah, so I'll just read now and maybe talk more about it afterwards. The Way In by Jane Hirschfield. The heart reason seen clearly. Even the hardest will carry its weak mark and sadness and must be forgiven. As the drought starved Ellen forgives the drought starved lion, who finally takes her, enters willingly then the life she cannot refuse and his lion is fed and does not remember the other. So few grains of happiness measured against all the dark and still the scales balance. The world asks of us only the strength we have and we give it, then ask more and we give it. Thank you. That's the poem. Um, I hope you guys followed because I think people are just silent. Um, okay, so can you hear me? Yes, you can yes, hear me. Oh, okay, because I'm worried that no one could hear me. Okay, so for me, <laughs> because it was very silent. Okay, so the for me, why I like that poem again, 2020 was a very, you know, in a way dark and somber year um, in general, but also in Nigeria, you know, as the, the year was coming close to the end of enters, all of that thing of how enters, um, what, you know, the crescendo that enters got to and all of those things and just how distraught everybody felt, how desolate 
the entire thing fell. Um, so, and since then, you know, the world hasn't got gotten much better since then or anything. And so I've held on to the poem. Um, I, I love the first two stand, um, stanzas or verses of the poem, but I particularly love the last two where it says, so few grains of sadness um, in the world and still the scales balance, uh, against, measured against all the good or something I forgot. So few grains of good measured against the sadness and still the scales balance. And then it says the world acts of us, only the strength that we have, and we give all the strength that we have, and we give it in act more, and we give it. So it, it just, it, it calms me, and it always calms me, and kind of, in a way, explains why just a little good news, like Toby Amazon, you know, we didn't know this terrible thing, and Nigeria has had a whole day to celebrate and talk about, you know, how proud they were. And then you heard the national anthem that was but on October, in October, on October 20, you hear it while she was, while the national anthem was being played, and then you felt the goosebumps, and you, some of us shared it here too, because it just felt beautiful. And for that period, at least, or for that day, you were proud to be a Nigerian, and everything. So in a way, but there's still a lot of terrible things that still, sad news is there, but in a way, it balances it, and you are not entirely. Um, um, hopeless about the state of the country and all of that. And then we always just find strength to move through things. You know, everyone is hopeful. We, we talked about in the beginning of this. And even though we've given all the strength that we have, the world just keeps asking more of us. And somehow from that nothingness, we still have some more to give. So that's why I like it. It's just been something I hold on to since 2020 when I found it out. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Senesi. Thank you, Sen um, Thank you, Senesi. I was about to unmute my mic. Um, Senesi, do you want to go on? No, over to you, actually. All right. So, um, so I, I already have. I think last week I actually had a conversation with um, Senesi about this particular, this particular expert she just shared, and we talked about it and. It's still as beautiful as it was. And every time it hits, that's, it has a great throwaway line where it tells you that. And you can, I think the moment you hear that, if you've felt anything or suffered anything that was real in a sense, or you had like um, this moment of disbelief in life or the universe, or maybe even the government and how things are going, it's something that you really, really understand because you, feel, you felt like you've lost so much and still, you end up realizing that sometimes you actually still lose more than you thought that you could lose. So I've had so many moments like that in my life. Um, so I would like to hear if any, any other person has something they would like to share with respect to what Sunisu just shared. Okay, so I can see any hands up. Tini, do you wanna share your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I liked the, the line that Tennessee highlighted, the one about two grains of good still balancing all of the bad. And I, I think that I also noticed that when the whole Tobia Muson thing happened, it came during a time of back-to-back -back terrible news. I mean, even the day that it happened, there were lots of terrible things happening. But then it was still a point of joy and something that brought everyone together around this idea of, of Nigeria. And I guess it's something to also think about with life in general, that um, it's just like when you're maybe trying to do something. So they always tell the story about the guy that invented the light bulb. I don't know if he was the one or whatever, but then about how he didn't get it for so many times and then he got it once. And then that once um, made all of the other times worth it. So yeah, there's something uplifting about that really that you just need some good. Even you just need like you need a bulb and then the darkness is no longer as absolute as just one bulb can make a place that is pitch dark um not as absolute as it is. So thank you for sharing that, Sanusi. 
So, um, Ida, I think now we have Gloria. Okay, I've seen Gloria's hand. Um, Gloria, you can speak over to you. Okay. Hi, Gloria, can you hear us? Hey, thank you very much. I, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you now. Okay, okay. So I'm sharing something from uh, um, Michelle Obama's book, Becoming. So, um, from the preface, and she wrote, there's a lot I still don't know about America, about life, about what the future might bring, but I do know myself. My father, Fraser, taught me to work hard, laugh often, keep my word. My mother, Marian, showed me how to think for myself and to use my voice. Together in our, crap, in our cramped apartment on the south side of Chicago, they helped me see the value in our story, in my story, in the larger story of our country. Even when it's not pretty or perfect, even when it's more real than you want it to be, your story is what you have, what you always have. It is something to own. I'll, I'll stop there. So I, this part of this book um, got to me, you know, it, it, it stuck with me because I was gifted this book by um, a lecturer friend. And when I read this part, it inspired me a lot. I am doing a story about myself and writing about myself. I've always been writing about myself on social media. And then I felt I could make it into a book to tell my story. And I remember at a point, I felt like my story isn't pretty. I felt it's not perfect. I felt there are a lot of bad news in my story. I wished I was writing beautiful things about myself. I wish my story were a lot different from what I have experienced in life and still experiencing. And so it kind of slowed me down, you know, um, thinking why do I have um, a story so far from perfect? But when I read this part of uh, Michelle's book, she said, you know, your story is, is something to own. It's yours, it's your own, even when it's not pretty or perfect, it is your own. And even when your story is more real than you want it to be, it is your story, you know? And it gave me that energy to, to keep writing about myself and my experiences. So um, that's what this part actually means to me. It's, it's kind of spurred me on, you know, that no matter how I think my story is not pretty or perfect, by the way, the story that I feel is not pretty or perfect has inspired so many people, have encouraged a lot of people, just the fact that we keep striving despite all of this, a lot of people have found strength and courage by it. So this book um, further encouraged me that it's my story, it's happening to me. It's, these are my experiences, I should own them. And that's what I've done. So thank right. you. Thank you so much, Gloria. Thank you, that was truly inspiring. I don't know if many people here have actually um, read this particular book by um, Michelle. I know that it's a bestseller, um, but I think two weeks ago, I actually was watching the Netflix documentary on the whole journey. And uh, through that documentary, there were a lot of times where she actually read out pieces from the actual book and it made me see her in a different light. And also, I've also had anxiety too when I write. And then I think a couple of times after ALS, some people like would follow me outside to ask me questions and I would be shocked at the fact that people actually pay attention. So I totally found this very, very relatable. 
Um, I don't know if there are any other people who want to share. I know that um, someone has their hands up. Um, Shim Uguru has her hand up, but I'm not sure if she wants to still talk about this. Sini, do you have anything you'd like to add? Or Sinusi? Uh, for me, I mean, yeah, I think I love it. So I, I love I love the agency about it. I think it's something that we forget often that um, our life is our story and it's and we're the ones with the pens. I, some, often it doesn't feel like we're the ones with the pens, right? It just feels like we're responding to whatever life is throwing at us. But then that reminder that at the end of the day, our lives are ours to shape um, to the best that we can. So I love that as a reminder. And I haven't read the book yet. I haven't seen the documentary, but there's something that's definitely on my on my list because I've heard that it's very inspiring and I look forward to being inspired. So thank you for sharing it with us as well, Gloria. Thank you, Tenny. Are you up? Do you want to say anything? I don't think he's here. So over to you, Chim Oguru. Uh, sorry, I wanted to say something about the... Okay, about please, the, I need to go on. Okay. Uh, okay, this is uh, Uchenna, right? Uh, okay, so um, I think something about, something about stories, uh, about writing, uh, writing our stories. So uh, I think I, I'm a graphic designer, so I think at the end of the month, uh, I usually try to make a design with some quotes on it. And uh, I can't get to the particular design now, but I think the content inspired them was something like uh, we are writing, we are, we are writing unique stories with uh, with our life. And uh, uh, I can't. There's a way. There's a way the stuff was summarized. I think I, I would post it later on if I find the, the design. So uh, I think uh, what uh, what was just read is is more of pointing to that fact that. The stories we the stories we have the lives we lead right they are all they are all unique. Uh, someone introduced himself and we talked about the, the our diversity right finding that commonness in our diversity. So that diversity has got to do with those uh, uniqueness right. And I think those are the things that actually uh, that actually make that actually bring out the flavor in in what we call life. Yeah. So uh, I think I I really I really I really enjoyed that. Uh, that's as that I was right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Uchenna. That was really insightful as well. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on it. I don't think there's any. Okay. Um, John C would like to speak. John, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I don't know whether I'm to speak on what has been said or I could read. I intended to read something. Oh, okay. If you intended to read, um, you could just go after Chimoguru. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Chimoguru, over to you, please. Okay. Thank you. I, I would like to share a point, but before that, I'd like to say something on uh, what Gloria read. I haven't read the book yet. However, I very much relate to, you know, what she talked about, the insecurities that we tend to face. I think it's something that as creatives, we have to deal with it very often. I think it's this uh, imposter syndrome. You doubt yourself, you doubt your credibility, you doubt the beauty in your story. And it's something that I too experience every day, very often. But like she said, our stories are beautiful even when they're not perfect. And one way or the other, they get to inspire people. All right, so um, the poem I want to share is titled For the Love of Ada. And uh, as a mini intro, this poem, it reminds me a lot of the state of Nigeria, or rather the state of Nigeria reminds me of this poem. Somehow they, they just uh, remind me of one another, basically. And I wrote this poem. I used uh, a lot of sarcasm in this. And there's also... Beyond the sarcasm, I used uh, words in the Igbo language. So I'd like to apologize in advance to anyone who may not understand certain things, but I do hope you pick up something from the poem. Okay, uh, like I said, it's 
for the love of Ada. A lump lies in my throat. It threatens to choke me. Ada, the daughter of the land, has strayed. Her underwrapper has grown too short, and our sons have lost to lust. Moons ago, it was observed she failed to visit the flower house, but we were silent. And then her belly grew, and we were alarmed, but silent, afraid to hurt her only daughter. Now she has bathed, left the poor thing at the river bank. Bless the fisherman who brought it home. Bless? I think not. For you see this child conceived on the doormat of atrocity, nursed at the nipples of contempt, fed with the spoon of neglect. This child, who bathed in the stream of confusion and ran back to play in the mud of chaos with his dearest friend, the swine, while we looked the other way, pretending not to have seen all that we'd seen. And when no one was looking, we shared knowing glances and shrugs. And we were silent, traded our voices for peace. Peace? This child who beat off his mother's nipples and spat them in her eyes. Now her younger children are starved. Oh, we wish we could help but our hands are tied behind our backs with an invisible rope as we walk past, refusing to see them, many of them squatted on attended and impoverished at every turn. Oh, Ada, our beautiful daughter, once the reason for wars and then the downfall of heroes, now lies blind all day in her hut, but far from lonely, for our very own men call at her, even strangers, travelers by pay her homage, they bring her gifts, adorn her with jigidas from foreign lands. In return, she lets them grace her bed and in between her legs, unwashed for years, she leads them into her ungroomed wasteland. But they do not perceive the malodor, nor do they mind, for she's a dish on a platter. And oh, what stench the incense oozes. We pass her compound hastily, calling out brisk greetings through scrunched up noses and half covered mouths. But we assure ourselves nothing could smell better. We do not believe it, but anything for Ada. We feed her calabashes of deceit, pour her freshly topped palm wine from the god of lies and get drunk on the leftovers. Shall we extol the fisherman for this child who taunted his mother, his brothers, his sisters, and me and you who dragged his siblings by the neck and drowned them in the Okuru, leaving his mother childless, a child who only yesterday beat his mother sore that was not all, took the aguba and sliced her up, smoked her over the apple and made the esosa soup he served us at the village square. And we knew, yes, we knew, that with each bowl of otara, we swallowed a piece of our own, our flesh, our blood. Folks say she got her due for she birthed this thing. And we all nerd in affirmation, even though we know that we knew and we remember that when she sought directions, we turned the other way. When she erred, we shrugged it off, and to her questions, we were silent. We neither approved nor was our disapproval expressed. So we have no share in the sin, nor in the blames. Now we must away with the child, purge ourselves of this calamity. But once more, for the love of Ada, we stuff our eyes with aku and seal our eyes with cotton. We stuff our ears with aku and seal our eyes with cotton as he goes around impregnating our little daughters whose under wrappers now barely fringe their butt cheeks, who miss the flower house and leave their infants by the riverside. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shimoguru. That was, that was really something. Um, I mean, from the beginning, I already just uh, started placing the similarities to Nigeria and it was definitely very political. So, um, does anybody else want to share? Yeah, I want to say something. Okay, so yeah. Nasi. Mm. Yeah, so I like that it's a political poem, but in itself has no direct, you know, reference to politics or Nigeria or you know, president or things like that. I like how allegorical it is, if I'm um, to say that. So you know, using Ada and the child she better, she better, and then as, you know, a metaphor for whatever nation of, you know, just, it's also just a story that you could follow on its own without even um, thinking of Nigeria. And it has all its story, but if you also think of it as a political point, 
it, it works that way perfectly as well. So it's a really nice one. I, I think it's funny that you say um, Nigeria remind you of the poem. So it, 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 I'm guessing you didn't write the poem necessarily with Nigeria in mind, but after you had written it, you saw the similarity or something like that. But yeah, it's a really good one. Thank you. Thank Did you, you say something? Yes, I said, I said thank you, Sunu. See, um, well, to, yes, so to me, I think maybe because she said it was about Nigeria that I immediately started seeing um, the similarities. Um, but what you said about it following through as a, as a story, as a poem on its own, also holds. But as soon as she started, I was like, oh, yes, this is like, you know, this is Nigeria. Um, so thank you for sharing, Sunu. See, and it's um, over to you, John C. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to share something. Um, it's uh, by Angela Duckworth. It's, I think it's really popular, but I just wanted to share it because I've been reading this for a while now and I've been slow about it because of how, how much I think um, it relates with me, uh, I should say. So it, it's um, Angela Duckworth's book on grit, the power of passion and perseverance. So I'll be reading on the, I'll be reading a chapter she termed purpose, just a few paragraphs. All right, so um, it, it goes first. This moment, just a moment. He goes thus, my guess is that if you take a moment to reflect on the times in your life when you've really been at your best, when you've risen to the challenges before you, finding strength to do what might have seemed impossible, you realize that the goals you achieved were connected in some way, shape or form to the benefit of other people. In some, there may be gritty villains in the world, but my research suggests there are more gritty heroes. Fortunate indeed are those who have a top level goal so consequential to the world that it imbues everything they do, no matter how small or tedious, with significance. Consider the parable of the bricklayers. Three bricklayers are, are asked, what are you doing? The first says, I am laying bricks. The second says, I am building a church. And the third says, I am building the house of God. The first bricklayer has a job, the second has a career, the third has a calling. Many of us would like to be like the third bricklayer, but instead identify with the first or second. I'll just, I'll just stop there. But um, this is a very, very inspirational, for me at least, very, very inspirational writing. And I think it's, 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 old, it's um, also very popular by an American write American author Angela Duckworth. It talks about purpose and it just says that, you know, everyone really has something. If only we see what we're doing the right way, we should see it. Uh, but we live in a country, for example, where, and, and I think this is rather global, not just in Nigeria, a local problem, where um, some people think the banker is not as important, for example, as, as the politician or the garbage man is not as important as, as the, say, you know, lecturer, for example, you know, but, but, um, or, a it's, or a doctor, thank you. But, you know, this, this tells us that what really matters is how we see what we're doing, because everything we do is important if we learn to view it the right way. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for sharing. Um, I know that um, Tanya said um, one minute in the beginning, but I almost wanted to say don't stop because I was so immersed in everything that you were saying and I just didn't want you to stop. Um, but it was really, it was really a very lovely and inspiring piece to share because I think on some very small level, I, I was secret, secretly hoping this would happen because I, I've always wanted to hear where people find their inspiration from, like that little germ in words that they go to to just find a bit of comfort. 
So that was really great. I'm so glad you shared that with us. Tini, would you like to say something? Yeah, so, um, I mean, thank you for calling on me, Aida. I, I know Angela Duckworth because I listened to her podcast. She has a podcast with, um, uh, is it Stephen Levy? It's one of the guys from Freakonomics and she's a very bubbly person. So she's Asian American. And when you listen to her speak, she has so much energy, right? She's like one of those people that can go on forever. And she tried to explain where she came up with, I mean, with the whole idea. I mean, she's a psychologist, but then about how she came into the concept of grit. And it was really partly because of her upbringing, because um, if you know some things about Asian households in America, there's usually a lot of pressure to do very well, to do very well in school, to do very well in your career, you know, just generally speaking. So she was conditioned to be a high achiever. And the interesting thing about, um, but the interesting thing I found about this passage, I found it very inspiring. But then my my realistic brain was also now kicking in to say that, you know, one of the reasons why some people only see what they're doing as laying bricks is because they do not believe in it. So in life, it's often a privilege to find yourself spending most of, most of your time doing something that you actually care about. Um, what happens in many of our societies, um, and especially even more so in the West, is that, and to an extent here too, is that you have to do things because you need to survive and not because you care about them. So you don't care about whether it's a church or whether it's a house of God, but you care about it being bricks because you're paid according to the number of bricks that you lay per day. So I just wanted to reflect on that privilege because we all want to get to a point where we are doing things that we actually believe in and that we take pleasure in and that, and it's, and that we have a vision um, invested in but thank you so much for sharing for sharing that um john i believe so yeah that's it from me Ida. all right thank you so much Danny. so the next person we have on our list is farida um over to you farida um good evening everyone my name is farida um, I would like to share a poem by David Diop, and it's titled Africa. Well, and it grows thus, Africa, my Africa, Africa of proud warriors in ancestral savannas, Africa of whom my grandmother sings on the bank of the distant river. I have never known you, but your blood flows in my veins, your beautiful black blood that irrigates the fields, the blood of your sweat, the sweat of your work, the work of your slavery, the slavery of your children. Africa, tell me Africa, is this your back that is bent? This back that breaks under the weight of humiliation, this back trembling with red scars and saying yes to the weep under the midday sun. But a grave voice answers me, impetuous child, that tree young and strong, that tree over there in splendid loneliness amidst white and faded flowers, that is your Africa springing up anew, springing up patiently, obstinately, and its fruits bit by bit acquire the bit, bitter taste of liberty. Well, um, <clears throat> the reason why I love this poem is I think it's kind of linked to the current Nigerian situation. Do you know in the past, the colonial masters have tortured Africans a lot and they have actually faced a lot from the colonial masters and it was really, really tormenting. But then it didn't le let them actually give up so easily. They actually continued to struggle until they attained independence. So I think if as Nigerians, if we can actually unite together and still be optimistic, then I, I'm very, very sure that Nigeria is going to be better again due to the current situations, like most of the institutions that we have in Nigeria have collapsed, like the educational institution, the economic institutions, the political institutions. We are having, we are facing a lot of challenges and problems in Nigeria. But the, one of the problems that we are facing is that it's not the fact that we cannot actually overcome those challenges, but the fact that most of us have lost hope in a better Nigeria. We all think that like there is nothing good that is going to come out, out of Nigeria and Nigeria can never be good again. So most of us actually just disengage from the political activities. You can even see a lot of people these days do not even have 
their voters card. We don't even take part in the actually the voting processes and we don't even think about who is competent enough to be the leader because we mostly disengage ourselves from this um, from the political aspect and it's kind of actually affecting us because we have to make the decision ourselves. They are there as our representatives and if we don't unite together and find a way out of this problem, then I think there is no how we can actually <clears throat> overcome these problems. And I think if we continue like this, probably Nigeria is going to be empty and nothing is going because as it is with the insecurity issues, some people that are rich are actually leaving the country, relocating to different places. And before you know it, the country itself is going to collapse. So I actually love this poem because it's actually given me kind of inspiration because if our heroes past could actually <clears throat> pull through all their pains, the torture they went through um, by the colonial masters, then I don't think it's not going to be possible for us. Like it's, it's going to be possible as long as we are very, very optimistic. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for sharing that, Farida. Um, I mean, I like to think that I live under the rock in this country. But even under the rock that I've been living in, I've um, I've been well aware of like all the, I would say panic and the general state of hysteria following like the whole um, insecurity issues we're having. And I think that generally people at this time are very, very agitated. And a lot of the times while commuting to work, I hear people talking about how the best option is to leave, the best option is to flee. And personally, I've had a couple of concerned acquaintances come up to me and tell me, I hope you're like working on your next plan to leave the country. And I would tell them that, oh no, I think we should stick around and fix it. And so I think in that light that I've been at, where I've been considering, do I actually see a future for this country? like your thoughts and this poem just helped reassess that, just helped me reassess that and made me think about that and still feel some sense of hope and belief that, you know, we just have to hold on a little bit longer. I don't know if more people feel that way. Um, Sanusi's hand is up and Kabur, that Kama is also also has his hand up. So Sanisa, so you've spoken twice, so he can he can go. Kabur can go. Kabur, Kabura can go first, and then you, Sanusi. So over to you, Kabura. All right. Um, I think um, Farida Farida has really touched um, something that I'm very passionate about: the negritude um, times. Uh, David Diop was born in Senegal. Um, but they were actually not quite contemporary with people like Birago Diop, who, who was also a Senegalese, born in Senegal. And of course, we, some of us uh, that can remember, we have um, Leopold Seda Sango, who was um, also one of the famous Senegalese poets. And I think the West Africans did a lot particularly Francophone West Africa in the negritude um, mold. And after some time, they were really like, okay, let's get out of it now. Let's now move on. We're Mother Africa and all that, as it helped us, we should move on, uh, colonialism and all that. But I think that we haven't really moved on. And I'm happy that a, a young person like Farida is really resonating with this point because I remember speaking to a group of writers a few weeks ago where I said that I believe in negritude and I believe in Africa. And that is why if you, the first um, poem in my latest collection is titled Song of Africa. And I think that those, those people like David Dio really, really were, I could, I could feel their attention being born in uh, France and all the perhaps luxury. He wasn't born in Africa like 
like his namesake, um, but he, he felt the pain of Africa. And I think that it's something that is, um, it, Africa, is, Africa is like a mother, uh, you know, because when I was asked, what, what do I think of Africa? I said, Africa is like, it's like the mother and everybody will come back to her. But most people are like, no way, let's move on. We're no longer going towards that mother Africa and all that. But I, 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 I am one of those who believe that we must address it. Those people touched on it. And then perhaps Westernization. Um, I think David died in the early 60s, if not 60s. So the people who came around that time, as they were beginning to get the feel of Western education and all that, they kind of thought it was uncool to be, to have the negritude kind of a spirit. And I think that's why they missed it. If someone who was not born in Africa could feel the pain of Africa from what he sees or from what he saw, from what he heard, from what he read, what about us that are living in it? And you can even talk about Nigeria now. Those who, with my friends, and I'm talking of people in international development, when we're talking in the office or in meetings and stuff, and you say you have hope in Nigeria, they're like, are you for real? So for me, that attitude of getting back to our roots is really, really very important. And today I am happy that young people like Farida are beginning to like David Diop, who some, some of us, um, we should get out of colonial, colonial mentality and all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, over it, but I finally, I believe that there is always something you can take from everything. I mean, yes, we don't have to go back to Mother Africa and look for that pristine Africa, that vagin, v vaginal Africa, the Africa that is a virgin, that is verdant, that is untouched, that is full of resources, that is a mother that is not, that is full of milk. Yes, we can go back to that fully, but then we cannot ignore that we need something about Africa to be in us, something about our country to be in us if we are going to do something. And I think we see that a lot. We see people who are not in Nigeria, but they can't get Nigeria out of themselves. They love Nigeria. They are there having the best of life perhaps, but they're thinking, I need to go back to Nigeria. I need to go back to Africa. And then we have people here who are selling off their businesses, who are selling off their cars, their lands, just to go to, to the West. So we can take from either side, but we cannot let Africa out of us. Let me not go on because that's something I am I'm passionate about. So thank you, Farida, for, for bringing that up. And um, I've, you have given me hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kabura. That was that was really passionate. Um, I could I I I yes I completely relate to all of that. So um, Sanusi, over to you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hello. So um, disclaimer here. I'm not trying in any way to contradict Kabura, but I held this opinion and yeah, I, I I wanted to share it and I'm. Like I just want to share, it, but not because as a response to his or any of that. So, um, I mean, on hearing the poem, when she when they said the deal, I I I remembered. Yeah, I've read a lot of deal poem, but the moment she started and said, um, you know, Africa, my Africa. Well, it was. It, it, I I feel like. It, it brought it was nostalgic in in many ways, but one of the ways was that it was also kind of humorous because I remember the poem as something when I read it, you know, studying literature and all of that. I loved it. I I got the sentiment and everything. But it's also something that in a way that I, my ideas and um, be, um how will I say my ideas and opinions on it have become um, somewhat more complex than that 
And also because I've seen, I see it as the template for a lot of um, young um, poets who want to write about Africa. They usually start with, you know, Africa, my Africa. So that's the humorous part for me, because when it started Africa, my Africa, it, it almost just felt like that poem, Th those type of poems. But of course, it, it's, it's way better um, for the time it was written and all of that. But what I would say, though, is um, some of the sentiments you expressed there, oh, though I've never known you, ah, for me, you say, though I've never known you, I've never known this. Maybe in reference to uh, not born there, but if you've lived there, if you've come and spent some time there, in a way you've known that Africa is what currently is now. And I feel like sometimes we need to, in order to move forward, in order to build what we have at the moment, while trying to take from history, we we'll have to kind of tone down the romanticism, right? You know, so a lot of poems, you know, and that's one of the issues I think um, um, the people who were against negritude ha had with the negritude movement. People like um, Shoinka and the rest, where it's like, there was a lot of romanticism. It's almost like, oh, we are painting this fantastical and almost unrealistic picture of what Africa used to be. Yeah, there were great things about it, but it, there were also horrible, bad things. And Negritude, in a way, really just wanted to, you know, extol and say, it's basically a version of what we say now, you know, the Black don't crack, um, Black is beautiful. You know, the, the elements of it in present day, just not in the same way as let's go back to traditional. So it's just, the whole thing is just funny and nostalgic for me, listening to, um, Thank you very much for sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Stanusi. Uh, I completely, um, I completely caught into that part. You said like how they always introduce it to like with Africa, my Africa, and it was, I know that I was constant. She just as soon as she said that, it was it reminded me of like so many poems I studied in school. And I think someone chatted in the group to say, thank you for taking me back for Rita. So thank you for taking us back. The next person on our list is Tini, who is also co-hosting. So she's going to be sharing something with us. Hey. And uh, yes. Um, yeah, just to say uh, thank you, Farida, for sharing that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to jump into the Africa conversation, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I want to share a poem, a poem from a book that I really like. So first of all, this book was a discovery. I found it, I, I went to university in the University of Ghana and um, there was a, an official bookshop, but then I realized that just upstairs of the bookshop, there was another bookshop and it was smaller and it was more for like abandoned books. So that was where you could find really cheap books and usually old books. But I'd always go there to just check if they had new stuff. And I found lots of classics. They're very cheap. At the time I was buying the books for one Ghana CD, two Ghana CDs. And at that time, one CD was like maybe, how much was one CD? 100 Naira. Yes, or less than 100 Naira actually. And then two Ghana CDs. So this particular one, I, I think I got it for three Ghana CDs because I can see in there, I know you can't see it, but then it's written there, three CDs. It's a collection of poems by someone called Wanda Coleman. I don't know why I picked it up because I didn't know how before I picked it up, but then maybe I like the title. It's called Mercure Chrome. And I'm going to read the very first poem in the collection. So it's sort of like the introductory poem. And um, I should wonder it's, a little bit racy. So I have a story about the poem. When I first uh, picked up the book and I, I like, I read the poem, I liked the poem, but I didn't really capture on for some reason that there was some sexual content in there. I don't know what I was thinking about, but for some reason it didn't click. And then um, I was in school, then I had this, there was this guy, I don't know whether he likes me or whatever, but then he was a pastor. So he came to my room to visit me or just to say hello. And then I gave him the book and told him, oh, I really like this poem in this book. And then when he read the poem, he gave me a very, very funny look. 
And then I was thinking to myself that wait, what like what's going on? And then after he left, I read the poem again, and that was the first time that I realized how much um how racy uh, it would seem to a lot of people. But um, Manda Coleman says it's not even about sex at all. It's it's more about politics in America. So I'm going to read the poem. The language beneath the language, under your belly, there is gnawing in the bones, subterranean and abysmal, the bites that small, the unscratchable itch, cold fire. Now he penetrates me against the landscape of my own blood and demands escape from the rotten tongue in which he's caged. This is the form I wear. Out of my pernicious reason and my slam driven mind comes the clay I shape into pleasures for your knowing. The angles of his body cut at my grasp starved hands. He's born hard as young granite at my softness. The authority of his beauty demanding the familiarity of my flesh. Thus you hold me, frozen in your doubtful vision, in your study of my brownness. Believe my curious fingers, trust my daring fingers, as a probe your opened wound to find a roundness. So that's the poem. And um, why did I like the poem? I don't know. I didn't read it as, I don't know. I think I, I, I read it more as talking about vulnerability. So about being exposed um, one way or the other. The poem is supposed to be an allegory for racism in America and just America's underbelly, right? Um, I, I just liked how raw it was and how honest it was and how it was cutting through very clearly. I like Wanda Coleman. She's she's almost like um the other lady. Why is her name not coming to me now? The other very she's so she's a black woman poet. She, she was a black woman poet, and I thought she was comparable to um the very famous black woman poet maybe Shanusi can remind me of who of the name that I'm trying to remember but uh yeah that's um the language beneath the language by Wanda Coleman thank you so much Jenny um it was really it was really really good and I'm going to go and revisit this poem after because that's how much I really liked it but like you said, it was racy, but it didn't seem that way to me. Actually, it really didn't seem that way to me. I could understand the whole American context of it. I don't know if, I think Sunusi has typed in something on the group. Yeah, it's the person I was trying to remember, Maya Angelou. So she reminds me of Maya Angelou to an extent, to an extent, oh. poetry. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. So um, does anybody else want to comment on Tenny's face? Yeah, let me let me say um, that I also didn't find it crazy or or that at all. I mean, racy. Um, I think that it is it is. I find it a fresh way. You know, um, there are some themes that are that are very much worked, like overworked. So when you try and portray it in fresh ways then that that makes it a successful point because um even today we say the government reps us and if you say that today that's a cliche but if you try and couch it in a in a different form so it's nothing new per se but the way of saying it and the words chosen are fresh and that's what makes a good point because i don't i think we have it's not that we have run out of themes or things to write about but um we, we can't be writing the same the same way or the same things over and over that's why we say some things are cliched and stuff like that so to me that's just a fresh way of saying how um a problem really gets into you and kind of um uh, just just uses you or, or or diminishes you and i think um the the words used there were very appropriate thank you all right, thank you so much, um, Mr. Kabura. I think you're the only person. Is there anybody else who would like to comment? I mean, I, I do agree with what um, my Oga, Mr. Kabura said. Um, it, in a way, I feel 
it, it, it's similar to what was the, the second poem that was read, I think it was Gloria who read it, read it. I forgot it, it was that, that piece that was read here that it, it said it was political, where we said, oh, it, this is political, but on its own is it, it a story where, or, you know, it's a poem, but that tells, that paints a picture that does not even have direct references to to politics or the political situation, but you could see that it, it, the entire piece is a metaphor for something. So, but the interpretation of it also depends on on the point of the person's reference. So, if the person's mind is already towards the racist side, or one or two words used there can just um, make the person now say, oh, this entire thing is about you no know, sex or sexual encounter. And then it, it usually just um, goes that way. Yeah, everything, and honestly, everything can be read in that manner the moment you just turn that switch on in your brain, read it like that. So, so in that way, you can say everything is racist. But yeah, it's a really nice piece. Um, and either way, whether you want to see it as a racy piece or whether you want to see it as a political or you know social commentary piece, I, I think it works and that's just markers of a great piece. I totally agree with you, Sanusi. To me, it is very political. I think it's just the words like Mr. Kabura said. Um, it's it was very, very political to me. Um so. Penny, are you there? Yeah, um, either you can share yours. All right, so since there's nobody else um, interested in sharing, I will be taking I have my... Share. Can I share something? Just yes, to, please. Just briefly. Um, All right. When I was preparing for this meeting, I was actually thinking of sharing something from the, the, the stillborn by Zainab Al-Kali, um, but I, I, I write very short poems. So I'm gonna read the first poem in my collection, the man, um, I mean, Chant of the Angry, very short. And before right. I say something about Zainab Al-Kali's book, okay, Song right. of Africa, Song of Africa, your pride retains this ancient chant, this song woven of kindred tongues. Your pain fuses kinsmen in Pentecost, it was theirs, now it's ours. Your song now drips on me, like rain on a scorched day. The scrub of a toiling dance, it was ours, now it's mine. Your bosom also draws me, like the unfurling of a maiden reborn. Your rulers are chains around your heart. When will I sing your song? Just, just to go with uh, the, the negritude poem. But the last, um, The Stillborn was written by Zainab Al-Kali in 1984. It was first published in 1984 and uh, by Longman UK. And then it was um, second, it was also reprinted by Longman Classic in 1989 and then Longman Nigeria between 1990 and 2002. It's been used in secondary schools. And this edition was published in 2019 by Craft Books. So it's a classic actually. And I've read this when I was young, but it was also the book of the month for the <laughs> Hero Book Club based in Medjugorje. And the, the very last segment, the paragraph, less than, is just about a page and a third. Uh, the last segment of the story, it goes, it goes like this. Let me just read it quickly. Or maybe I should tell the story. It's about um, a village set. It's a village setting. So it's a clash between modernity and village life. And it so happened that Zainab Akali is from my own village. So all the things she was describing, I could visualize them. The dances, <laughs> the traditions, I could visualize them. And I, it was really, really, very nostalgic to me when I read it. And I think they said she's one of the first Northern uh, female writers to, to, to emerge. And so the book details the story of a girl 
who was in a Muslim family and uh, it was uh, Islam was in the minority at that time uh, because Garkeda is um, is a missionary village. So it talks about the clash between the new Christian values and the Islamic values, as well as the traditional values in the early, uh, from between early 1930s to the 1960s. And so it, occurred, it, it, it detailed the story of how the girl um, followed her lover to the city and stuff like that. And then how the disillusionment that happened to some of the characters in the book. But the last bit of it, um, after she moved, the, the, the boyfriend moved to the city and had a living lover and had an accident. When, when she came, he, she, she discovered that she ha he had a living lover and then she had a, he had an accident and became um, disabled. And she ran away to her sister and found out that her sister's marriage was even worse. And so she was going back to the husband and the um and 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 that's how the story ended in the last page or so it says lee felt a firm grip on her shoulder and woke up with a start lee is the main character shua a 10 year old daughter had her hand on lee's shoulder and was laughing into her face were you dreaming about my father mama she asked lee felt embarrassed she quickly looked up and met our steady eyes across the room. So the girl knew her father's name. It was just as well. In a few seconds, Lee had gone 50 or more years into the future. She knew now that the bond that had tied her to the father of her child was not ruptured. And in spite of everything, in the soft cradle of her heart, there was another baby forming. This time, Lee was determined the baby will not be stillborn. Big sister, Lee called. Mm-hmm. Awa raised her head. I'm going back to the city, she said simply. To the city, Lee? Awa asked in surprise. Yes, to the city. And I am taking Shua with me, she said firmly. Awa shook her head thoughtfully. Are you going back to him? Yes. Why, Lee? The man is lame, said the sister. We are all lame, daughter of my mother. But this is no time to crawl. It is time to learn to walk again. So you want to hold the crutches and lead the way? Our asked. No, Lee answered. What then? You want to walk behind him and arrest his fall? No. I will just hand him the crutches and side by side, we will learn to walk. May the gods of your ancestors guide you, our said. May the good God guide us all, Lee replied. That's the end of, that's how the story ended. And I think it's for someone like me, who's, um, who's an optimist and who, he, who doesn't want to be too cynical, I love the story in the sense that it tells us that we all have our own shortcomings and we shouldn't be heroes either. Lee said she wasn't going to hold the crutches and lead the way. Lee said she wasn't going to walk in front of him. She said they will walk, she will hand over the crutches to him and they will walk side by side. She's not gonna be a hero, but she's going to be a, a shoulder to lean on, a supporter. And, and, and that's what, that's this, the way the story ended to me is the way I look back to my village now where this story was all set and it has become ravaged by Boko Haram. Um, I lost my brother who was kidnapped and killed by Boko Haram. And a lot of things have happened and the sort of peace and quiet we used to enjoy the harmony between Christians, Muslims and uh, traditional religionists have all kind of, the lines are becoming sharper in, the, in those days. You wouldn't know who's doing Salah or who's doing Christmas. Everybody's together. Uh, so now, um, the lines are becoming sharp. And we are looking for people like Lee who will, who will hold the hands mm. of, who will not lead the way, who will not hold the crutch, but will stay side by side and walk alongside. And I think um, that is what I like about the book. Uh, it's the, the setting is Garkida, but of course 
she she fictionalized the name of the place and everything, but it's it, it's a it's a little village in Adamawa, and um, the missionaries were there in 1932. So Christianity started there in a very very long time. It will be 100 years um, of the missionary work there next year. So I think uh, we should all be encouraged. I don't think we all need to be heroes, to be honest. I, I don't want to be a hero. I don't want to carry somebody's crutches for him. And I don't want to lead someone, but I want to be side by side. And we can draw support from each other. For me, that's the way I, I, I look at literature. I don't try to look at the the stylistics or anything. I just look at the message that resonates with me. And that's how this book just kind of resonates with me. Not because it's, I understand the background to it, but because it, it speaks to um, the kind of a person I am. I'm sorry for taking so long. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. K. Uh, we were really entranced. Rorita, would you like to comment on his piece? Because uh, she's been, she had a couple of questions on the chat platform. Rorita? Yeah. I'm here. Okay, so well, I actually, I actually enjoyed the story. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Like, I, I'm even, it's making me have an interest, like, to get a copy of the book so that I can just read through. Yeah. All right, thank you, Parita. So the next person on our list is Paul Engi. Over to you, Paul. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello. Good evening, Paul. Hello. I can hear you. Sorry, I muted myself for a bit. Good. Good evening. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. So, um, I've actually listened to every one of us. These are quite um very nice contributions and poems from each and every one of us. So I just want to share this um this poem by by Erin Hansen. Erin Hansen um, is an uh, Oregon, Oregon based visual artist. And I happen to be a visual artist myself as well. Uh, basically we are all creatives. So um, she wrote this one, she titled this one, Not, I don't know how I can actually connect this with um, the conversations we have already established here in the group about leadership, about negritude, about, um, um, a whole lot of other discussion, but I think the first person who actually spoke, or if not, um, actually did say something about not believing in herself and feeling like her story was not worth enough sharing. I think we all have that. Even me too, a kind of a kind of um, um, um imposter syndrome and all of that. So I really find this poem interesting. So I decided to share. Uh, it goes. Um, hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Paul. Yeah, we okay, can hear so you. It, go, it goes, um, not, title not, the poem is titled not by Erin Hansen. It says, it, I read, you're not your age, not the size of, your, of clothes you wear. You're not a wit or the color of your hair. You're not your name or the dimple in your cheek, you are all the books you read and all the words you speak. You are your croaky morning voice and the smiles you try to hide. You are the sweetness in your laughter and every tear you cried. You are the song, songs you sing so loudly when you know you are all alone. You are the places that you've been to and the one that you call home. You're the things that you believed in and the people that you love. You're the photos in your bedroom and the future you dream of. You are made of so much beauty, but it seems that you forgot when you decided that you were defined by all the things you are not. So this is the poem. And I actually, I think Erin here um, 
um, from her uh, from 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 what she does as a painter. She actually started um, a particular style of painting called I think um, the impressionism, something like that. Um, painting seascape, landscape, and all that. She, she's trying to actually um, give so much courage and hope to people uh, who um, who are going through a lot. I think each and every one of us go through these or that. So we should be able to look at ourselves and see what we actually are made up of and what we are not made up of. We should be able to filter the noise. It's actually not um, an easy task. It's sometimes quite daunting, but um, if we can take that time to actually filter through, uh, we could always um, know who we are and we could always be proud of who we are. So I think um, this is what I have to share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Any comments? Um, Shim, Shim Oguru, I'm not sure I'm saying your name rightly. Uh, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I enjoyed the poem. I, I find it quite reassuring the way it uh, begins by telling you the things you're not, telling you the things you are, and it really throws some light on how um, the, um, the source of a lot of our insecurities just, um, it has to do with how we are so fixated on what we are actually are not, we are so fixated on things we can do nothing about, whereas there are other aspects of our lives that are actually good, other aspects that we could focus more on. And I think, well, that's why I draw from the poem and I find mm. it quite reassuring. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jim. Um, Farida, would you like to comment? We have Josh Emmanuel um, next, but Farida, if you have a comment, you can um, quickly share. Hello. Yeah, I actually love the poem. It's actually kind of inspiring because I can even relate at oftentimes like we have great ideas and things that we can actually put out to the world, but because we normally used to feel really vulnerable and nostalgic, we feel like maybe it's not really a good thing and people wouldn't like it. So we used to have this fear and anxiety and it used to make us weak and then we, some of us actually used to give up on those things. No, so it's kind of inspiring that and motivating. I really love it. All right, thank you so much, Farida. Um, so this will be over to you, Josh Emmanuel. Okay, hi everyone. Hi, Josh. <laughs> Well, um, before I start, I want to say a few things. I'm actually very excited to be here. I almost didn't want to join because I was on transit, but with everything everyone I've said, like I feel, I feel so so happy. Like there's just this. Um, I don't know. It's more like um, you know how you pass gold through fire and you separate the impurities from the impure from the real gold. <laughs> I just feel like I've been washed through all these words that have passed through. And I know there's this um, predominant topic. I don't think there's anyone that is Nigerian that would not be concerned about Nigeria or Nigeria of today. Because gone are the days where you would just be living your life and wanting to just be yourself and not be bothered about what's happening. But it's at our doorstep and we have to actively act. So I'll be reading um, a col um, just a page from a collection of short story, A Broken People's Playlist by Chimere Garrick. I don't know, I've always loved these short stories. 80% of the short stories just speak to me in different ways. So I'm reading this one. He titled it After Songs for some of us that have read it. This, this is the um, chapter four, Song for Someone. <clears throat> You're waiting for one man, but you're exchanging glances and half smiles with another man. Bald, who sits alone at a corner. A third man, a stranger, walks to you, stands over your table and offers to buy you a drink. Your teacup is halfway up when he speaks. You pause for a second, then glance at the stranger as you sip. 
when you reunite the cop with its marching saucer, you say, no, thank you. You flash a smile, which hope is polite, non beachy, but also non flirty. This is important. Also, you smile because you want to let him down gently without bruising his ego in front of his friends. You would notice he had come from a table where two other men still sat, drinking and watching both of you. The man pulls the chair opposite you and sits. His perfume, some expensive odd which he, was, which he has overdosed on, chokes you, killing the sooting scent of the ginger tea which you had been drinking in. He drops his car key for, and phone on the table casually, but strategically placed for you to notice he drives a Mercedes Benz and has an iPhone S. I hope you don't mind. I do actually, I'm waiting for someone. He leers like you just he leers like you just told him you wanted to blow him. He has the air of a man who expects everybody to be as enamored of his good looks as he is of them. He puts his elbows on the table and claps one of his fists in the other. You remind me of you don't hear the rest because you think Usher and you do a quick scan of his songs in your mind's jukebox. Select you remind me and start singing in your head. It's something you do. Remember songs and lyrics when people talk and sing in your head while tuning out people you don't want to talk to. You are in the middle of the second verse when you realize he stopped talking. You cut the music and stare at him like, what? You're not paying attention, he scolds. Now you want to roll your eyes hard enough to dislocate them. Instead, you say, please, if you don't mind, I would like to be left alone. Your tone is even respectful, even low enough so it doesn't carry beyond your table. Within earshot of the other people in the almost empty restaurant bar of the golf club. So I would stop here because it's quite a long read. But one thing I love about the story is the whole, um, the backstory of the story talks about someone that has gone through a lot but it's bouncing back to life. So um, for every point in our life, it's within us to be able to take control of our life, to take control of our environment. And that's what makes me to love this story so much. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much. It was really good. Um, I've actually wanted to read this um, the broken, broken People's Playlist by Mr. Garrix. But then I, I don't know, I didn't. And um, you just helped me realize what an exceptionally great writer he is. I don't know if anybody else would like to share anything. No yes, more comments? Me, 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 me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I mean, I wanted to share as well, but a few minutes ago, time don't go already. Don't yes, run. time. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to say how much I love um, Mira Garrick, because um, actually I've read a lot of books about the, the Niger Delta, but when I read the first one, um, Tomorrow Died Yesterday, I was just absolutely wowed. And just, um, I was comparing it with The Patriot, with um, uh, Yellow Yellow by Kaine Agri and stuff like that. So I found Chimera Garrick really, 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 really very good. And so when, the the playlist of broken people or, or something like that um it came out i tried to lay my hands on it a broken just people's to playlist a, yeah, a broken of, people's playlist yeah, when it, it came out yeah. i tried to find it i couldn't find it now two weeks ago i went shopping for books and i saw it so i've not started reading it but i, I can't wait to devour it so thank you for sharing from that piece of work to remind me that i need to read it over you will love it <laughs> All right, so do you have any more? Um, I'm not commenting on the teeth, I'm just saying if, if there's time to share, but you wanted to share it, please, so there's no time I'm guessing. All right, then. So yeah. I just wanted to make sure everybody else um, had set their pieces before I proceed. Um, so I think we should spare five minutes for her and close at five past. Please. She's All been right, so then. good moderating us. Please share with us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. K. Um, so I am going to be reading a poem by Brad Aaron Modlin. Um, I've always secretly considered myself a dysfunctional human being. 
And there was a time that I had that in my bio, but people thought that it was probably too negative. Um, and so that's just that just goes to say how sometimes I'm not very good at reading the line, like reading between the lines or understanding what other people feel more comfortable with. I'm sort of like an all out kind of person. And so I have loads of days where I feel like I have absolutely no idea what people are saying around me or when they learned um, what, what like societal niceties was and I missed that entire class. So this form is, when I, when I found this form, it was like, discovering like a new land um, or a new space, just something that I've always felt like if I had it sooner in my life, I would have been able to apply to so many instances or so many scenarios growing up. So it's called what you missed that day. What you missed that day, you were absent from, from, from fourth grade by Brad Aaron Modlin. So I'm just going to read through and then explain at the end. Mrs. Nelson explained how to stand still and listen to the wind, how to find meaning in pumping gas, how peeling potatoes can be a form of prayer. She took questions on how not to feel lost in the dark. After lunch, she distributed worksheets that covered ways to remember your grandfather's voice. Then the class discussed falling asleep without feeling you had forgotten to do something else, something important, and how to believe the house you wake in is your home. This prompted Mrs. Nelson to draw a chalkboard, a chalkboard diagram detailing how to chant the pounds during cigarette breaks and how not to squirm from sound when your own thoughts are all you hear. Also, that you have enough. The English lesson was that I am is a complete sentence. And just before the afternoon bell, she made the math equation look easy. The one that proves that Hundreds of questions and feeling cold and all those nights spent looking for whatever it was you lost. And one person can add up to something. So that's the poem. And um, like I said, when I started, I've had lots of scenarios where I feel like that one day that I wasn't looking, people learned all the things that they needed to be like stronger or more normal or a certain form of pro proper in the society. And I always just feel like someone who is in this merry band of misfits. And so this poem to me, it's like, just, just sort of reassesses, reassets that, that feeling that I've, I've had. And also just feels like it, it was actually very appropriate to the things that you're going to face as adults or even in your adolescent years where you needed all the simple tricks to life, like how you could find comfort in long walks. But then these are things that nobody teaches you in school. These are things that people don't really talk about. These are things people don't really spend so much conversation, like have so much conversations about anxiety or fear or abandonment issues. And so it just feels like this poet imagined this conversation where there are all the tricks to how to get through these things. But then even on the day that the teacher said all the stuff, he actually was absent from school. So it sort of gives him an excuse to not knowing. Um, so that's that's really why I don't know, I really, I really relate to this poem. I really, really, really relate to it in so many ways. Um, but yes, yeah, so. Are there any comments? Yeah, I have a comment. Um, thank you so much for sharing the poem, Ida. If you would share the the title of the poem on the author again in the chat, that would be very useful. I also found it very relatable, really, because everything you said about growing up and depending on others for social cues, I think that was also my reality. There was a time even when I read a novel called Love Rosie, and it was about a man that had um, Asperger's uh, syndrome. And I thought to myself, wait, maybe I have Asperger's syndrome. But mm -hmm. it was really relatable. And thank you for, for sharing. It's always amazing the way we sometimes see ourselves in, 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 in things. And it reminds me of a line that I, 
I don't know if I read the line or if I wrote the line, but the line is in my head. And it's pretty much that at any given moment, whatever we're feeling has been felt by someone else in the world before. So, um, and it's always nice when you sort of like collide with um, expressions of the way you felt. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much, Jenny. Any other comments before we go? Yes, I want to share, I want to say something. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think particularly me, as in it's a personal experience directly in general, but for, I, I think, yeah, there, there have been situations where I really just needed the social cues because I didn't know what was going on around me. And maybe because my head has been buried in something else, maybe a book or something else. And so it, it, I feel, so for me, it's usually a temporary experience. But I've definitely had friends and you know acquaintances who tell me, oh, I really don't know how to navigate this. And they literally depend on me to tell them, oh, this is what this means. This is how you should act. This is how you should you know, navigate this and that. So in that way, it's relatable, it's recognizable. And yeah, it's nice. To, I, I think I can, I'll share the piece with them. So, so thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> thank you too. No, I'm, I'm happy you, 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 you loved it and um, you connected with it. So I think that that's, that's it for today. It's 9 p.m. It's after 9 actually. And yeah. This was actually really, really fun. When I when I saw the when I saw the what the team for this Friday was, I was so excited. I chatted at Tenny and I'm like, I really love this. Can we have more of this? And I was really, really excited because it's been something that I've always wanted to do. And I think also after posting that, a lot of people from ALS like ALS messaged me to say that oh like this was really really great and you know and some people said oh like they wanted to be there physically and I was just like oh this is like the first time and it's online so thank you so much Danny for actually thinking of this and for actually drawing this out because I I really really loved this it was really nice thank you Ida actually thank you for moderating this excellently um I hope you can hear me I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, thank you for moderating this excellently. I actually got the idea from the events that you hosted a while ago. Mm -hmm. So the thing that we're planning for this Friday filter, and I said, okay, let's do a reading circle. It's usually an intimate group here, so it's a perfect fit. Thank you for hosting this. Um, to everyone, yes, we are about four minutes past the hour. It's the Abuja Literary Society book jam. We have the Abuja Literary Society has four fr uh, events for Fridays every month. So our next event is going to be the open mic at Transcorp, um, seven to nine. Uh, that's next week Friday, I believe. And then we have another open mic after that. Then we have a book club, um, as a third Friday event. So you can join our community if you're not already part of the community. You can reach out to, I mean, I'll, you can reach out to us at Abuja Literary Society at gmail dot com, and it's been lovely. <laughs> it's um, I mean. It's been lovely being with everyone, talking to everyone, learning about all of these um, incredible poems and stories. And I hope you have a good evening. Um, Ida, would you like to sign off with anything else? I was actually had stuff to say, but then you started talking and then I forgot them. But I would, I would want to say um, thank you so much for everyone who participated because it was only as great as you for sharing and it was only it actually it was only it actually was a reading circle because we had people who participated so thank you so much for sharing thank you so much for commenting and thank you for also bringing pieces that we could really really connect to or feel like a sense of nostalgia towards the, the pieces so it was really really great um and i'm hoping that we get to have more of this can you just have more of this <laughs> So, yeah, absolutely. thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I shared this thing on the chat by the way, the book of the month. So okay, that's Yinka. Where is your husband? I wonder about the Z in that husband. It's like <laughs> it's yeah, like that's how it's spelled. That's how it's spelled. Yeah. Yeah. Yinka, where is your no. husband? Yeah. yeah.
Thank you. Bye, Dami Lola and Lizzie Blackburn. Yeah. Bye, Dami Lola. Bye, Lizzie. Dami Lola Blackburn. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's on the third Friday of this month. Thank you, everyone. Um, I like right. to we'll have it again as long as you're always open to lead hosting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> then we we'll okay. have this again. So um, okay. So for anybody who wanted the 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 title, Tani, I actually don't know how to post on the chat. That's why it went to you. I tried posting and then it just oh, went away. I was wondering. Okay, let me let me repost it on the general chat. So there's a this thing on Zoom where you can choose who you are trying to send it to. Uh, okay, but maybe difficult on mobile. So it's what you okay. missed that day. What you missed that day? You were absent from fourth grade by Brad Aaron Modlin. That's the poem you read yes thank you so much Sani, and thank you everyone so it's after nine um you can actually follow to for to know more on the next the next possible book jam reading circle you can follow us on instagram we have a whatsapp number and you can also tweet at us or send an email thank you all and have a good evening good night sorry yes it's it's really dark <laughs> Hi everyone. Good night to everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank Bye. you, Senia and Nita. Right. Thank you, Senia. Okay, good night, everyone. Bye.